I can get the PowerPoint up here. So I wanted to start off by sharing something that I'm involved in in Sweden, and it's called VegChef. We had a workshop here yesterday on plant-based cooking, and you're welcome to join that again today at 10.45. Anyone here that joined it yesterday? Was anyone here? Yeah. And today we're going to have even more delicious things and uh, practical recipes, principles, how to change your lives for the better as well. Uh, Veg Chef is a little more serious cooking school. This is a proper chef program. And it's the only one in Adventism in Europe. I believe there is one in Brazil otherwise. But all over the world otherwise, this is the only place you can go within Adventism that you will learn a pro professional degree that is in line with the Adventist principles that is focused on plant-based cooking. So you spend essentially six months training to get this, pro uh, this degree. You are three months with us in Sweden on campus. So you'd have to come to Sweden. And we have five modules. So there's theory and practice, number one. And there's intensives in plant-based nutrition. There's an intensive in business, entrepreneurship, how to, how to do finance, how to start up your, something yourself, because many of our applicants, they want to do a food truck or a restaurant or some center of influence so that they can share the message as well. Then we also have an intensive in uh, plant-based desserts, how to make nice, uh, tasty, uh, healthy desserts. And we send our students out at the end for eight weeks of internship. So they go abroad to different, mostly Adventist restaurants and institutions, health centers, etc. So we partner with the restaurants all the way to New Zealand, Israel, Australia, many places in Europe, etc. So the cost, <laughs> you can come and see me afterwards. We don't have to talk about it right here. But uh, it's a great opportunity where you can really, you, you will be leaving us with a Kumi Chef certificate. And uh, it's a professional chef's certificate that is recognized in the, the whole world. So that's a proper degree, and I'm very happy for it. Some pictures of our students. That's our kitchens there, fully furnished. Um, we've done some major investments to, to make it state-of-the-art, up-to-date. And these are the students from last year. Uh, this year, we will have, I think, two or three from the UK as well. So there's a great international mix. There's a, there's a very big range group also on ages, etc. But today, I'm going to talk about something else. So that was just a little promo in the beginning. I'm going to talk about something called the Blue Zones. Have you ever heard about the Blue Zones? Right, great. So this will be fresh information for many of you. I just want to start off with a prayer together. So let's pray, everybody. Dear Heavenly Father, I want to thank you so much for a new day, a new life. We come before you because we want to learn from you. We want to learn to order our lives according to your pattern, to be more like you, Lord. And today, as we look at wisdom from the Blue Zones and how you have led your people, we pray that you will give inspiration to change our lives so that they are more in accordance with this. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. When I was a child, I had a neighbor, had a beautiful dog. Do you know the name of this dog? What, what's the race? Yeah, so this is a golden retriever, I believe. I'm not very good with dogs. Um, but it was a very lovely dog, and I loved playing with it, petting it, and I was always over by the neighbors visiting it. His name was Skippy. And uh, Skippy was very healthy, very, uh, very active, you know, like dogs are. But one day he got very sick. He was very sick, he wasn't eating, he wasn't very lethargic, low in energy, just walking around. And I was like, hey, Skippy! And, and he was very, very slow and very lethargic. So we, we figured out something was wrong with the dog. And our neighbors took him to the hospital, and uh, they discovered something in his belly. Now, this dog had gotten into the laundry, and there was nothing he loved more than dirty socks. So he had eaten, I think he was 16, 17 pairs of dirty socks. 
And so his belly was full of these socks, and of course he was, he was getting sick from this. So they had to do surgery to, to save him. I like this illustration because it reminds me of us in many ways. You know, the Bible says our body is a temple of the Lord, right? And often we stuff it with things that are not supposed to go in there. Just like this dog, right? And then we blame God when we are sick and suffering. And we say, ah, oh, why did God allow this to happen? Ellen White said this, the tables of many professed Christians are daily set with a variety of dishes which irritate the stomach and produce a feverish condition on the system. Their bodies are composed of what they eat. But when suffering and disease come upon them, it is considered an affliction of providence. Why did God do this to me, right? God said to the people of Israel, and we read this statement yesterday. It says, if you keep my commandments, if you keep the commandments I give you, the laws on health, the laws of everything that I give you, I will put none of the diseases that I put on the Egyptians. And remember the Egyptians, what diseases did they suffer from? They had all sorts of diseases. They had cancers, obesity, tuberculosis. They had all sorts of lifestyle diseases and contagious diseases. For I am the Lord, your healer, he says. So God wanted to give the Israelites something else. He wanted them to have long lives. He wanted them to have uh, strength and uh, great mental capacity. If Israel, if they, Israel, would have kept God's commandments, God promised to give them the finest of the wheat and bring them honey out of the rock. This is what Ellen White says in Christ's Object Lessons. With long life, God would satisfy them. Do we all want long, happy, healthy lives? Yes. Now, this is what God wanted to give to the Israelites. He wanted to give them long and happy lives. So how do we get these things? Today we're going to talk about longevity, how to live long, healthy, happy, holy lives. Now that sounds very easy, but how is it done in practice? I find it fascinating that 4,000-year-old book like Genesis, the book of Genesis, written around 4,000 years ago, it mentions longevity, it mentions the age of humankind. God says, my spirit will not abide in man forever, for he is flesh, and his days shall be what? 120 years. Now, Adam and Eve, they lived long, and the antediluvians lived long lives. But after that, this is roughly how long people lived. In fact, the oldest documented person ever to have lived was um, born in 1875. Her name was Jeannette Clément. I don't know, it's French, so something like that. She is the documented oldest human being ever to have lived. There are others that are 121. Actually, that person is from Jamaica. Then there's one who's 120 from Japan. But she is considered the oldest person ever to have lived. Now, Jeannette was born in France only 50 years after the death of Napoleon. And when she was 12 years old, she met Vincent van Gogh. She, she lived over a century. She was one of these super centurions, they call them. Now, I would like to live 120 years. So let's look at some of the principles that Jeannette followed. And uh, her routines. She was a very uh, strict person, the way she lived her life, and a very small lady. She was only 140 high and weighed around 50 kilos, 45 kilos. Very small lady, but she preserved a lot of energy that way. <laughs> she went early to bed every day and awoke 6.45 every day. You know what they say, early to bed, early to rise. Yeah, and you know the rest. Healthy, wealthy, and wise, right? <laughs> that was one of the things she did. She started the day with prayer and thanksgiving by her window. She was a very optimistic, very cheerful woman. 
She was always praising God for things that were happening. She, in that respect, reminds me a lot of Ellen White. She was known for this woman that was always talking about Jesus, always happy with, with uh, Jesus. She did 30 minutes daily gymnastics in her room before leaving. Now, that's routine. Did you all do this this morning? Huh? <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> yeah. All well, this time, there's more time in the rest of the day, right? She had a simple breakfast. Now, I would like to say she was a vegan, but she was not. She lived in the 1870s. People didn't know much about veganism in that time. But she had a very simple breakfast, and you'll see more of what she ate. Hot drink with some milk and rusks, which was sourdough cubes. Every day, very simple diet, very simple diet. She was not vegetarian but she had a simple diet full of fibers and whole grains. And you know, the biggest discrepancy we have in nutritional intake today is actually fiber. We lack a lot of fiber. We eat a lot of processed, fine flour kind of things. So she had a lot of fiber. She lived in a cold house. I don't know if that has anything to say about it, but she never used heating. And in fact, the reason she moved into a uh, um, retirement village was because she got a frostbite when she was 112 years old. So she said, ah, I gotta move to the retirement village now. Now, she bicycled until she was 100 years old. Uh, can you imagine? Very active woman. There was one thing, though, that they say if she had not done this, she would have lived 140 years, maybe. I don't know. But she would have lived a long time. She had a, one bad habit. She occasionally smoked. Imagine that, huh? From the age of 22 until 117. So people say, oh, but if she smoked, then I can smoke, right? No, they say if she had not smoked, she would have been 12 years older. She had a chronic cough, and in the end, the smoking is what killed her. So she had one bad habit, really. Now it's smoking. So today, we're going to talk about something called the Blue Zones. And Jeanette is an example of this, of people that live long lives. And what are the secrets that they do? And what does the Bible tell us about how to live those long, healthy, happy lives? The Blue Zones, since you had not heard about it, I'll tell you quickly about it. So these are areas around the world where people live the longest. You got that, right? So it's, it's places around the world where people have the longest lives. So you have Okinawa in Japan, Ikaria in Greece, Sardinia, Italy, Nicoya in Costa Rica, and Loma Linda, California. Anyone heard of Loma Linda, California? Yeah. How do you think the people of Loma Linda, California can live so long? How can they be part of the Blue Zones when America has some of the biggest obesity rates, um, yeah, they, because they are an Adventist group. They're quite strict with the health message, and so they are considered one of the blue zones. And they're a testimony to the Adventist health message. There's a lot of studies done on the Adventists of Loma Linda. When I did my master's in public health, secular university, always talking about Adventists. They're always talking about Adventists. Ah, oh, there's a great people. I could say, I'm one of them. I'm one of them. <laughs> the people of the Blue Zones um, are old people, generally. They live very long lives. Now, people say, oh, they have good genes. Those guys, they got good genes, good genetics. But I don't, you know. Uh, my, uh, my, my father only lived 80 years. My grandfather, you know, 70. So they have good genes, those people. But science says that longevity is only 25% heredity, 75% lifestyle. So there's no excuse for us anymore, right? Now, what, were, what are the things that the people of the Blue Zones generally do? All those places around the world I showed you, right? They have things in common. I want to list them for you. The first one is they eat a 95% to 100% plant-based diet. In Okinawa, for instance, they eat um, sweet potatoes, like it, every meal. They eat a lot of legumes. They, it's plant-based, a lot of tofu, tempeh, miso, all those things. Fantastic meals. And they cook everything themselves. They, they make it in the gardens. You know, they're very active people. 
and they exercise regularly. They don't always out in the gym and stuff, but they're just out walking, tending to their gardens. They're bending up, you know, bending down, standing up, and very active all the time, these people. This man down here is 98 years old, still digging in his garden from Costa Rica. Uh, they walk around 10,000 steps per day, they say. And they practice something called logotherapy. It's a summary. Logotherapy means just they have meaning in their lives. Many of them are Christians, religious people. They have a strong sense of purpose. I'm here for a reason. I'm not just a mistake that, you know, I have no... They have a strong purpose with their life. I am needed, I have a place, very important. And they're very cheerful, usually, very optimistic people. They like to look on the bright side of life. I could have a whole sermon on cheerfulness. It's something I need to practice a lot myself, but it's a great habit if we can cultivate cheerfulness. Just that alone will give you more years of life. Because when you are pessimistic and negative, it raises your cortisol, your stress levels. Cortisol reduces the immune system. Over time, you're more prone to infectious diseases. So cheerfulness is very important. They have faith, these people. They might not all be Christians, but they have a strong faith in God. Most of them are Christians, though. They believe that God has a purpose for their lives, and they pray regularly just like Jeanette, every morning, etc. They're not all Adventists, so they don't, they don't all practice Sabbath, but they have rest days. Now, we live in the machinery of today. Everything, every day, you're up and working, running around, but they take days off, so they have rest days. They're very community-oriented community people. They prioritize relationships with each other above money. So this is very important as well. They don't smoke, they don't drink. And they practice something which I think is brilliant. It's called harahachibu. This is a famous statement from Confucius, actually. Regardless where it comes from, it's a good principle. Harahachibu means you eat until you are 80% full. They don't overeat, these people. They eat simple diets, small small portion, not small, but 80%. Often, what happens, we stuff ourselves, and then, oh, I need to sleep for half an hour, right? It's a very bad habit. So they eat until they're 80% full. And just that principle alone will save you a few years. There is an emerging body of studies on faith and longevity. There's a professor by the name of Harold Koenig from the University of, um, what is that? I think it's Harvard. Uh, the, dis the Department of Re Religion and Health. And he has studied longevity and spirituality, religion. How a healthy religion, a healthy Christianity, he focused on Christianity, actually. And people that are part of a faith community, like yourselves. And he said, if you have a faith that is healthy, a good picture of God, good support network in the church, generally, you will live 7 to 14 years longer. So just being religious, just being a Christian, you will live longer. I think that is fascinating. It's something to tell the secular world. Hey, join us and you will have a longer, healthier, happier life. And uh, they, they argue that it has to do with something called the telomeres. Now, this is a bit advanced. I will, I'll not bore you with it too much, but it's the ends of the DNA chromosomes. When we age, they get shorter. But it's due to stress and all those things. And religious people, they generally can deal with stress better. They deal with difficulties better because they have faith in the afterlife. They have a faith in God. They have trust. And so they deal with difficult times better. So. Their telomeres are longer, and they live longer lives. Fascinating, fascinating. Now, the blue zones is not something that just came about the last few years, because Eden was God's blue zone. He gave them a plant-based diet, physical work, regular rest, fresh air and sunshine, community with each other, and God. That sounds like what we read about the blue zones, am I right? So, the Garden of Eden was 
the first blue zone. It was God's blue zone. And God wanted the whole world to be one big blue zone. He wanted this kind of pattern that he put in Eden to be reflected everywhere eventually. Ellen White says this, the Garden of Eden was a representation of what God desired the, what? The whole earth to become. It was his purpose that as the human family increased in numbers, they should establish other homes and schools like the one he had given. Thus, in course of time, the whole earth might be occupied. The whole earth should have been one blue zone where people lived long, healthy, happy lives. Well, before sin, they weren't supposed to die anyway, right? But we sinned, we fell out of, we were driven from the garden, and it wasn't until the Israelite nation that God once again could establish a blue zone on the earth. So God chooses Abraham and the Israelites, and he wants to build up this image of the blue zone again. He says in Exodus, we read this, if you listen to my commandments, I'll put none of the diseases. I will change your lives. Trust me, he said. I'll change your lives. You won't suffer from anything or what the other nations suffer from. I will make you a place of longevity, a blue zone among the nations. He said to Abraham when he chose him to start Israel, he said, I will bless you and multiply you, your descendants, as the stars of the universe, of the heaven. And through your offspring, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. God gave us a health message not to keep it to ourselves, but to bless the nations. Right. To bless the earth. He says in Deuteronomy, I have taught you, he speaks to Israel, I have taught you decrees and laws as the Lord my God commanded me, so that you may follow them in the land you are entering to take possession of. Observe them carefully, for this will show your wisdom and understanding to the nations, who will hear about all these decrees and say, Surely this great nation is wise and understanding people. What other nation is so great to have such righteous decrees and laws as this body of laws I'm setting before you today? As the nations, the Philistines, the Amalekites, all the peoples around them, the Moabites, would look upon the people of Israel who lived long, healthy, happy lives, who had meaning with their life, who had a strong relationship with God, who had cheerfulness. They would look on these Israelites and they would say, what do you have that we don't have? Teach us about your ways. Teach us about your God as well. And they would be a blessing to the whole world. Ellen White says, if Israel would keep his commandments, God promised they would get the finest of the wheat and bring them honey out of the rock. With long life would he satisfy them and show them his salvation. Even the heathen, she says, even the heathen would recognize the superiority of those who served and worshipped the living God. Can we say amen? Amen. amen. It was God's purpose that by the revelation of his character through Israel, men should be drawn unto him. To all the world, the gospel imitation was to be given. Through the teaching of the sacrificial service, Christ was to be uplifted before the nations, and all who would look unto him should live. So here you have Israel among all the nations, right? And they have these wonderful laws, this beautiful environment, and all the other nations would look to them and say, wow, we want some of this. And then they would study the sacrificial system, they would study the sanctuary, and they would say, wow, we want this God as well. And so they would come and be part of the people of God. As the number of Israel increased, they were to enlarge their border. Other, the Moabites would join, then the Ishmaelites would join, and then these guys would join, and soon, she says, until the kingdom should embrace the world. Thus God desired to bring only the Israelites, all people under his merciful rule. He desired that the entire earth should be filled with joy and peace. That was the purpose of Israel. That is the purpose 
of Adventist Church today. You see how this works. So the health message is an entering wedge for people from the outside. They see, wow, these people have something beautiful. They live long, healthy, happy lives. They are more fulfilled. They have less depression. They have more cheerfulness. I want some of that. They're drawn first, maybe from selfish reasons. Oh, I just want to live longer. But then as they come in and they see, wow, and the faith in God they have, this beautiful God they love and worship, we want some of that. You see how they're progressing and they become part of the people of God. That's what God intended for the health message to do. But what happened to Israel? They failed. They failed. They kept it to themselves. They said, ah, it's not for anyone else. It's just for us. This is the special rules. We are the people of God. It's only for us. Now, I've seen that tendency among us as well. We don't like to share the precious things sometimes. But God says it has to go everywhere. What happened to Israel? He drove them into captivity. And the knowledge of the blue zone was lost. It wasn't until the Adventist church and the health message that we got that God again revived the idea of God's blue zone. So he chose the Adventist church to impart a knowledge of true health to the world around them. That's why you and I were summoned. We were called to be part of this new blue zone. We were called to be the Israel of today. I took this picture in, uh, GC, in the, at the GC conference in 2015. It was in San Antonio, Texas. And someone calculated that around 90,000 people were there. 90,000 Adventists, all gathered in that big football stadium. And I sat there in the back, looking at all these people. And I thought, are we a blessing to the world? Are we a blessing to the nations? We were there in San Antonio. And everyone, all the restaurants there, they had adapted. Some were not serving coffee. Others were closed on Sabbath. And yeah, there was many impacts we were having. It was very interesting. There was some, some good and, and also some, some questions. I, I wonder, are we a blessing to the world? Because God has called us to be the light of the world. Let me tell you, give you a reality check. I want to take a break here, so all stand up. I see some of you are nodding off here, so let's stand up here. Yeah, yeah, we can't have anyone. All right, and stretch a little bit. Uh, you can bend over a little, get some. There you go. I know it's early in the morning. They give me the morning session, so yeah, if you can, oh, you can maybe do that. So if you are able to do a little semi squat there, that would be wonderful. You know, one of the best exercises you can do in the morning, actually. As soon as you get out of bed, just do a few squats. It's one of the best things you can do for your posture, etc. All right, so now we're awake again. Good. Welcome to sit. So we're, we're, we're rounding off our message here. <clears throat> just want to give you the facts. Very simple. Our world is suffering under the biggest burden of disease ever to afflict mankind since the Black Death. And the Black Death killed 40% of the world's population. So today, more than 40 million people die every year from non-communicable diseases. What is a non-communicable disease? Uh, it's a fancy term for diabetes, for Cholesterol, high cholesterol, heart disease, blood pressure, cancers, yeah, all of those things. Exactly. So non-communicable, you cannot transmit it to someone else in comparison to a transmittable one, yeah. So the world is suffering under, we can also call them lifestyle diseases because most of these are lifestyle uh, related. So that is the current situation among Britain, in Europe, actually in all of the world, there's only really Africa that's been spared a little bit, but it's getting there. I was in Africa a few months ago, and McDonald's is coming in, all those things are coming in, and the people are running to it like, oh, hallelujah. <laughs> I tell you, this will be in a few years, they'll look like America. 
30% of the population obese in America. Now, 71% of all deaths on the world every year come from lifestyle diseases, from the food we eat, from the lack of exercise, all of those things, 71% of all deaths. So we have something to give there. It is projected that in 2030, that's, uh, that's in around 10 years, we will get up to 60 million deaths every year. And 90% are going to be from non-communicable diseases. So I told you, NCDs, non-communicable diseases, are curable. And we have the health message to help these people. We can really save the world if we believed it, if we practiced it. We have something to give that the medical institutions of the world are not giving today. We have something to give that the world is languishing for. But sometimes we are embarrassed of it or, oh, it's too hard, pastor. But this is something that we can really give to the world. From Adam to Eve until today, in all ages, God has sought to impart the health message to the world through his people. Now you are those people today. Adam and Eve are not around today. The Israelites are not, not around today. But you are the blue zone of this time. You are those special people that are called to impart that knowledge to the world. In all ages, there's been a people that had that knowledge. And now you are those people. God longs to bring all his people under his merciful rule. He desires that the entire earth should be filled with joy and peace. I want to read a last statement to you, and this statement from the pen of our prophet Ellen White, it changed my life. I was studying theology at the time, I wanted to be a minister, and I love, I believe ministry has a great place, Bible studies, preaching, all of that, visitations, wonderful. But this statement threw my world, and I knew I had to study also something on health, to combine those things. She says, one of her last statements before she was old at this time, she says, I wish to tell you, she's speaking to the ministers, I wish to tell you that soon there will be no work done in ministerial lines but medical missionary work. That's a, that's a special statement. No work done but medical missionary work. Now, medical missionary work does not exclude the preaching of the gospel at all, but... In a secular world, in an increasingly secular world, if we do not meet people where they are, with a health message, ministering to their needs, we will not be able to teach them about Christ as well. There is only one method that works today. It's Christ's method alone. Christ's method alone will give true success in reaching the people. You want to reach Britain, right? So this is the method. The Savior mingled with men, that's number one. We can't just sit in our clubs. We can't just sit in our churches. He mingled with men. Number one, as one who desired their good. Two, he showed his sympathy for them, ministered to their needs. What were some of the needs the world is suffering from? 90% will soon be languishing under NCDs, right? He ministered to their needs, and thus won their confidence. I have been working with medical missionary work for many years. There is nothing that builds such confidence as when you meet someone's physical, temporal need. Amen. When you meet that need, they are open to anything. They are open to anything you have to share with them after that. He won their confidence, then he bade them, follow me. That is the method of Christ. And I pray that that will be our method, that we will reclaim this message and go forward boldly as we use Christ's method alone. Let's pray together as we close. Dear loving Father in heaven, we see that your method was so ingenious. You didn't just come and say, you met a, you met a need that really was there. You met people where they were. You spoke a language they could understand. You led them as fast as they could follow. And you really met the needs of this time. So we pray that we will be the same, that we will be God's blue zone right now, that we'll be an example to the nations, 
that they will come and say, tell us more about your lifestyle. Tell us more about your God. For that is our ultimate aim, Lord, that in everything we do, as the Bible says, whether we eat or we drink or whatever we do, that it may be to your glory. Pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.